Okay, so um, I gave this talk uh, in a session at AGU that was dedicated to um, portions of major faults that slip both seismically and aseismically, observations and implications. And so it seemed like a really good venue to highlight the PBO speed meter network. So this, the PBO network is a network that's really fine-tuned to exactly what that particular group is interested in. And that is recording um, short-term stream transients. And so the objective of my talk at AGU was to sort of introduce the spin meters, show some of the really neat signals that they've recorded in the park view section of the San Andreas, and then show where the data products were that they could get these really you know, nice data sets from. So it was AGU, so I started with the summary because it goes so fast, so I'll do the same here. But basically what I'm going to work my way towards is that we have eight borehole spin meters and two long baseline laser spin meters installed in park fields as part of the safe boundary observatory. The northernmost spin meters record multiple creep events, tens of nanospins over hours, um, many times through, over the years. Um, and, and in contrast, the southern spin meters have only recorded two events in five years. The stream signals suggest propagation of creep, and it, if you look carefully at this data, it might be able, you might be able to constrain location of the creep using this same data. And finally, the, both the borehole and long baseline spin meter data are, are, are available as Earthscope level two data products from the ASCO. So this is just a bit of context for those in the, at the meeting that, that weren't aware. The Pip Boundary Observatory is the geodetic component of the EarthScope program. Uh, it consists of about 75 borehole spin meters, six long baseline spin meters, and over 1,100 continuously operating BCS. So way back 15 years ago when people were sitting down to design this observatory, Megan was writing papers on uh, ETS events in the Pacific Northwest. And for a while, people had known there was something happening San Juan Batista area of uh, the San Andreas, they were, they were seeing these like unusual slow earthquake type events. And so it was recognized back then that if this observatory was to truly capture safe boundary deformation processes, it had to have an instrument type that could record really, really small, really short term stream transients. And so for those that um, haven't ever seen one, this picture on the um, on my right is a long baseline laser spin meter in Shalom. That's the southern park field area. And what you're looking at here is about 500 meters of vacuum tube. And what these spin meters do is they use light to record the change in distance between two fixed points. So on the on the other side we have, um, I think most people in this group know what. Uh, a borehole spin meter, and if you look closely, you can see four uh, changes stacked vertically within one inch beam. And then if you look even more closely, you can see these little um, nuts here, and they show you the orientation of the gauges. Um, one of the really nice things about this photograph, too, is that you see three generations of spin meter engineers. Uh, the guy in the white hat is Nick Gladwin from Australia, who actually started Spear meter, the spin meter program way back in the 70s and 80s. And then we have Bob Mueller from the USGS in the 1980s days, who was installing spear meters in park fields. And then you have Wade from NASA pushing forward. So the, sent, the, the resolution of these instruments is down at the um, sub-nanospin level. So Mick will tell you that this instrument can resolve 0 0.05 nanospin. And Duncan will tell you this is down about a tenth of a nanosphere. So one rule of thumb that Duncan likes to use is that if you took the state of California and you stretch it by the width of a hair, these instruments can record that stream. So that, that's what you're getting when you, when you put spear meters in the ground. Okay, so just for more context on the sensitivity of these instruments, this is a paper that came out of JPL in 2012. And what they tried to do was they took um, a GPS baseline, so two points, two GPS points, 
recording at high frequency, I think one sample per second here. And then they tried their very best to get the in measurements out of those two um, GPS points with uh, the smallest amount of noise possible. And so then they compared that to strain measurements made by the long baseline strain meter down in, uh, down in San Jacinto Falls in Anza. So using the, the long baseline strain meter as their reference point, the red and the blue show um, the strain noise level for various types of GPS processors. And then the black is the, the borehole and the laser strain meter. So you can see right away, if, you, if you're interested in signals down at this in this frequency band, you still have to use a strain meter. It still is two to three orders of magnitude more sensitive than anything you can do with GPS today. Okay, so moving to the part about um, the uh, eight thousand feet. So this figure is, um, oh, it's kind of washed out, but this is California. Um, here we have the San Andreas running uh, along the Cape boundary. Um, uh, the Hayward Falls here branching off. And so the orangey type zones are regions that have fractured during major earthquakes, 1906 earthquake, 1857, Port Cajon to the south. And then these green areas that I've highlighted here, these are the regions that we know are creeping a seismically. The red dots show where we, where UNAPCO put the borehole strain meters, and the yellow squares where the laser strain meters are. Okay, so as I said, it's been known for some time that that central section of the San Andreas is creeping. And Titus et al. put a really nice paper together where they went back 35 years and looked at geodetic data. And they calculated the creep rate along that central section, that green section in the middle of the San Andreas. And what they found was that if, you, if you're in that central creeping section within... Um, Within one meter of that fault zone, about you're, you're accommodating about 75% of the state's creep, uh, Cape boundary creep rates between the North American and Pacific Slope motion. And then as you move north towards the termination of the 1906 rupture zone and south towards that Fort Cajon rupture zone, then the slip rates taper off. And so the PBO strain meters are installed just where I put the uh, red triangle. Okay, so zooming in on Parkfield. So the green zone to the north is that creeping section. Then to the south where it's red, that's the 1857 Fort Cajon. And then the red dots are the PBO strain meters. Um, for a little bit of reference, Saifal, the Saifal hole is right at that uh, yellow triangle to the north. So um, what we see is that we see multiple creep events on this strain meter B073, which are very enhanced for those in those park fields. And then we see very little as you move south, southwards towards this rupture zone. And then B079 and Shalom, they see we recorded two significant events in five years. So here's a plot of that data from B073. And I, I took six months of data, detrended it, and plotted it. And so I think it's very easy to see that these creep events are standing out well above the noise. There's nothing complicated about picking out these signals. So the, uh, the blue and the red are um, the earth tides and biometric pressure. So that just gives an idea of the, of the size of the signal above the noise. So um, this is six months. And if we just zoom in to see what one of these looks like in detail, it's just amazing. So here we record it for 20 hertz. We're recording these signals at 20 samples per second. What I'm showing up here is the one hertz data. So um, this is covers spans about six hours, and you can see the change in shear strains with time. So about 20 nanostrains, and it's all over after an hour. So you, you need that high rate data to get the resolution right. Then moving along to the May 2012 event, another example, just a really lovely clean signal. You know, you don't have to do a whole lot to this data to get a nice signal to model and work with. So here's just a plot of all of those creep events over the past five years. So the red and the blue are the different shear strains and the magnitude of their offset. 
because these are surface instruments, there's always you wonder well, what's the rainfall like. So the rainfall is plotted below, and we see creep events when there's rain, and we see creep events when there's no rain. So it's your first order; they're not driven by rain. Then looking at the seismicity, um, it's not in really deep sites. There's maybe some sort of clustering around this window here that correlates up here. But the, this seismic data, I just pulled it from the ANSS catalog, so it just goes to a 0.1 magnitude. But what would be really nice would be if someone would take this and look carefully at tremor seismic data for the really small stuff and see if, if there's some temporal correlation between the creep and the stream. Okay, so the B073 event, they're fast, they're over one hour, and they depend on landscape and atmosphere. So now we move south to Chelan, right around the termination of that rusty zone phase from 57. And what I'm showing here is what the laser strain meter recorded, and then what this B079, the PBO borehole strain meter recorded. Um, I plotted the four gauges, and uh, the black is the um, Earth tides, the reds, the residual when it's, when it's all taken out. And so what you can see right away immediately is that instead of happening over an hour, it's happening over two days. And it's much, much bigger. You're up to 100 magnitude. So, um, and then the second event was in Punichai. Um, a complicated event. It occurred over a week. And there's probably multiple things going on here. Just difficult to to get a first order of what's going on. But the, the difference between the northern and the southern uh, events is the amount of time over which they're occurring and the magnitude. So just going back to that 073 uh, event and just picking one of them and looking at it a little bit more closely, what this looks to me, it looks very similar to um, these for some time now, since 2005, when we first put the three meters in, we measured these ETS events in the Pacific Northwest. You see these beautiful sine waves as the stream signal propagates south to north. And so this is the same kind of thing. It's a propagating signal. So what it looks like, or suggests to me, is some sort of propagation of flux along the coast. And so if you were to take a fault and chop it up into little segments and then propagate the creep along it. What would a strain meter such as B073 see? So it was a little movie, but I can't think of but what you would see. Oh, there it goes. Okay. So just imagine that's a little creep pulse sort of propagating down the trough. What this top plot shows is um, the strain that this instrument records due to the slip on that particular fault. And then what the bottom plot shows is that cumulative strain. So what I see in very much at all, two millimeters of slip, the upper two kilometers, um, you're seeing something that looks fairly similar to what you see at B073. So to a first order, the simple Okada, Alaska cast based modeling, you're getting, you know, close to what you see on the stream meter. And then just taking it to the next step, and I, I didn't actually show this at OGU, but I thought I'd show it up here, is to actually make it a real life scenario. So we'll actually take the sign there through that area and slice it up and put a little bit of slip and push it down and see what happens. And um, again, you're getting, without doing very much at all, you're getting something pretty close to what the stream meter is recording. Okay, so <coughs> the hope was that people were now interested in stream data, and so I was going to go through where we got the stream meter products. So UNACO produces our level two data set um, for both the borehole and the long baseline uh, instruments. It's available in XML format. It's available in just tabs under the ASCII format. And that process data contains um, biometric pressure, corrections, earth tide, ocean load corrections, borehole trend. Okay, here is to get it to a research ready figure. So someone can pick up this data and start modeling right away without having to figure out, oh, you know, should I be modeling this based for pairs 
you know, uh, ocean load signals to try and just move it along that a little bit quicker towards a, a research ready product. And so uh, this is the PBO simulator uh, web page. Everything, this is our main place we encourage people to go to. Uh, every simulator has its own line and you can get raw data, um, ASCII data, look at plots. PDF files with all the engineers know so you can see what, what's happened at the site over eight years. And we do the same for the long baseline. We do the same. Uh, Duncan Agnew and his students, Billy Hatfield right now, Frank Dick and Frank Wyatt is the other PI down there. They process the long baseline with the simulator data and then push it to us and we make it available via the web page. And so in conclusion, we have eight portable simulators two long baseline laser simulators in Parkfield. Uh, the northern simulators see a lot of creep uh, occurring regularly. We see a lot less as you move south towards that lock portion of the San Andreas. And um, you may be able to say something about the origin of creep if, or the location of creep if people start to compare uh, these uh, seismic tremor signals that they're now seeing in Parkfield to where we see these uh, being transients. There might be something interesting that could come out of that. And then finally, all the data are available from the NASA.